Welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Dr. Melanie Buttle and I am the principal of Peter Zosky College, uh, where you are right now, and acting principal of Champlain College. Um, before I go any further, I wanna let you know that Trent Radio is recording tonight's talk, which is lovely. So thank you to Trent Radio for making that possible. And I also wanna let you know that we have guests with us in Zoom land. So there are 30 plus people also watching this talk uh, in the internet world, but they're there. So welcome to our Zoom audience as well. Uh, we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisagig Anishinaabeg. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations, and may we honor those teachings. Uh, we do land acknowledgements um, at Trent in lots of different ways, but I usually want to say a little bit more about what we are learning and unlearning um, in this area and in this territory. I think it's really important that we all do a little bit more work to learn a little bit more about the land that we're on. So I highly encourage that uh, for people that would like to know more. The First Peoples House of Learning, which is also found in this building. We are in First Peoples performance space right now. Um, but the First Peoples House of Learning website is a really valuable resource for knowing a little bit more about the treaties from this area and the history of this area. So it's a very good first start. Uh, I would also say that the Elders Gathering is coming up uh, next week, and it's a really wonderful experience uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit more. So that's what I will say about that. So this uh, talk this evening is sponsored by quite a few partners, so I'm going to let you know who those partners are and then introduce uh, Janine to say a little bit more. But the School for the Study of Canada, École d'Etudes Canadiennes, is one of our sponsors this evening. Department of History uh, is a sponsor, uh, Champlain College, and Trail College, and this is also one of the community speaker series, so uh, there is support from that group as well, uh, and thank you to all of our partners, thank you to all of you for coming, and I will turn it over to Janine to introduce our speaker this evening. Thanks a lot. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce the W.L. Morton lecturer today. W.L. Morton was a passionate Canadian historian and the first master of Champlain College. So the Morton Lecture brings together many threads. Each year, representatives from the School for the Study of Canada, École d'Etudes Canadiennes, the Colleges of Trent University, the Frost Centre for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies, and the History Department collaborate together to invite a speaker to engage our broader communities. And we are particularly fortunate this year in securing Dr. Joanna Joachin. Dr. Joachin graduated from McGill University in 2020 during the pandemic, it should be noted, and remained at McGill as a postdoctoral fellow until moving to take up an assistant professorship in Black Studies in Art Education, Art History, and Social Justice at Concordia University. She's already amassed a significant list of publications in addition to her doctoral thesis, which was a fascinating look at black women's hair and dress in the French empire. Her talk for today, which I'm very excited to hear, so I'm not going to, can, to take your time up here. Her talk for today is entitled Between Ought and Could, Self-Preservation and Self-Care as Spatial Acts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joanna Joachim. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope I'm speaking loudly enough for this thing to pick me up. I'm not sure. Um, I, um, I was telling Don that I tend to move around a lot when I speak, and so these things go in and out. Anyway, um, thank you very much for um, that introduction and um, for this warm welcome. At a, as a starting point, I do want to note that I work in Jojage, Munyang, also referred to as Montreal, and that it is the land of the Haudenosaunee Mohawk peoples, and Concordia itself is located on the traditional territory of the Ganyangahaga, one of the founding nations of the Haudenosaunee Feder uh, Confederacy. Um, and it's important to me to always be mindful of these things because I am of Haitian descent. I come from a people which was enslaved on Indigenous land and alongside Indigenous people, both on Turtle Island 
and in the Caribbean on the island of IT, which means land of mountains in Taino Arwa. Black and indigenous people are and always have been kin through the dual projects of colonialism and slavery. Committing, anti -race, committing to anti-racist work is committing to do decolonial work. And to fight for black liberation is also to fight for indigenous sovereignty. One cannot be without the other. This truth is at the core of my work and is the intention behind everything that I write and everything that I teach. I am grateful to my ancestors whose relentless resistance and miraculous survival are the reason I'm here in this room with you today. I want to thank Heather, Janine, Janine, and uh, Melanie, as well as Michael and Dawn, and everyone who had a hand in organizing this event and for your kind invitation and for all the time and energy that you've put into organizing this year's edition of the Morton Lecture. I want to thank each of you in attendance as well, both in this room and on the internet somewhere, for your time, your presence, and your, and, and your attention. Slide, please. Um, so I've got about like 21 pages of notes. We'll see how far we get. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to be presenting a short excerpt from my ongoing book project. Uh, there then here now, self-care and self-preservation as spatial acts. Don't get attached to the title, please. <laughs> I'm still working through uh, what this thing is going to get called. Um, the overarching project examines how Black women and girls negotiated the space between ought and could, as proposed by Jose Esteban Munoz, uh, by presenting Black hair and dress practices in the French Empire, in French colonial um, spaces of domination as creative texts produced through spatial acts. Uh, Munoz frames educated hope as something that is not about announcing the way things ought to be, but instead imagining things, what things could be. A central component of transatlantic slavery was the strategic use of violence, captivity, and forced extraction of labor to disrupt uh, the enslaved Africans' ability to access time, energy, and tools um, to maintain what I define and differentiate as self-preservation and self-care practices. There then, here now, explores these two notions and examines how cultural, material, and social deprivation compounded by the ubiquity of corporal punishment work to divest Black people of their humanity and disrupt African cultural practices as they relate to hair and dress. With this book, I look back to transatlantic slavery in the French Empire, in particular to understand the depth of these issues. I take as a point of departure Dr. Catherine McKittrick's work on cartographies of struggle in her book, Demonic Browns, wherein she illustrates that, quote, Black women are both shaped by and challenge traditional geographic arrangements, further proposing that Black women's way of negotiating their surroundings are intermingled with, quote, place-based critiques or re-spatializations, end quote. With there then, here now, I consider self-preservation and self-care through hair and dress practices among free and enslaved women as spatial acts, that is, as gestures which are examples of such re-spatializations. Throughout this project, I employ what I'm experimentally terming, again, don't get attached to the term, tenderness as method, which is an extension or rather deepening of the tenets of Black feminist art historical praxis, which I've been developing for a time. The chapter from which I'll be presenting today delves into what Horton Spiller's terms networks of feeling in the context of slavery. Using Spiller's proposal, I argue that these networks were fundamental for both survival and resistance. I'll be fo focusing on sections relating to New France, Quebec specifically, with the occasional stint to the related sites of Lomang or contemporary Haiti, which are also part of the larger book project. Slide. Uh, so this... Um, chapter is entitled, I didn't touch it. <laughs> um, so this uh, chapter is entitled Because of Qualities Which She Possessed Within the French Colonial Context of New France, uh, Saint-Domingue and Louisiana, Black women would have experienced various types of relationships in their daily lives. They were parents or guardians, 
they had access to and were denied different kinds of kinship based on bro the broader black community surrounding them inside and outside of their respective quote unquote home in uh, white captivity, as well as the more contentious interactions they might have experienced with white men and women. In Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, Spillers contends that in the context of slavery, the notion of kinship is stripped of nearly all meaning because of the very nature of the system of enslavement, simultaneously ungendering the enslaved and forcibly, um, and, and forcibly inserting the role of the so-called owner as proverbial quote unquote father, thus precluding the definition of black parental or familiar, familial roles in the common Western sense of these terms. In other words, the property relations produced by the social order of slavery rendered black kinship ties moot. She notes, quote, certainty if kinship were possible, certainly if kinship were possible, the property relations would be undermined since the offspring would then belong to a mother and a father, end quote. However, Spillers further underlines, oh, okay, all right. I will not move, I promise not. Um, however, Spillers further underlines that despite this, there remained a network of feeling binding black enslaved people, uh, lost my place, forgive me. Binding black enslaved people, which was materially cultivated with this chapter, I examine how these networks of feeling were cultivated by and among Black enslaved women and how these were influenced by French colonial geographies specifically. Thinking alongside Spillers in this chapter, I examine the multitude of relationships forming these networks of feeling, locating them as a foundational factor in the emergence and preservation of Black cultural production and placemaking or in Black livingness. The social geographies of New France, Quebec, Saint-Domingue, and Louisiana were vastly different from population composition to life conditions. These divergences would necessarily impact the types of networks of feeling enslaved women could forge and how these could be achieved. The types of relationships that black, black women might have forged depended on their environment and social context in which they lived. New meanings emerge when these relationships are considered with tenderness. These relationships shifted continually and can be understood as a site through which black enslaved and free women looked out for themselves, one another and their communities. They can be understood as sites through which they found and formed networks of feeling. Every new connection in such a network came to, with benefits and threats which need to be navigated th thoughtfully. Each of these geographies shaped Black lives and vice versa. This chapter lays out the typical life experiences of Black women and girls in French colonial settings as they forged relationship with each other as well as with white and indigenous women. Slide please. The evolution of Louisiana under the French impacted the Atlantic world as a whole. This evolution is inextricably linked to French colonies in the Caribbean and in what would become Canada. In fact, La Salle's third and final expedition from 1685 to 1687 would ultimately lead to the foundation of Louisiana. As this expedition bridged the gap between various colonial sites, Colonizers in New France petitioned King Louis XIV for permission to introduce enslaved Black people into the colony to compensate for, this, for the lack of cheap labor. In 1689, the king approved this request, and soon thereafter, enslaved Africans began being brought to New France in an official capacity. Many African-born enslaved Black people were thus further displaced after their arrival to the Americas forcibly removed from one plantation to another, at times worlds apart. Considered through bla a Black diasporic framework, the spaces and places of New France, Quebec, Saint-Domingue, and Louisiana are connected not only by major historical events, which impacted the relationships between them, but also 
by the constant flux of people traveling and communicating across geographies. While a portion of the enslaved population in New France, Quebec came from the United States, some came from as far as the Caribbean and Portugal. It would not be far-fetched either to assert that some enslaved people, rare as they may be, had been transported all the way from the West African coast itself. How might the intermingled diasporic nature of Black populations in these sites have shaped the connections between these three colonies and how they influenced each other and the lives of Black women? The Lemoines were a Northern Creole family to which were born 14 children of French descent. The Montreal-based family was not only behind the foundation of Louisiana on stolen land, of course, they also had financial ties to Saint-Domingue. Indeed, Le Moine d'Iberville, a highly ranked military officer from New France, Quebec, set out to quote unquote, discover Louisiana in 1698. He made a brief stop on the island of Saint-Domingue on his way, as was customary for ships sailing, to the, uh, sailing in the Atlantic Ocean. Moreover, uh, the first African slave baptized in Mobile was Jean-Baptiste, a seven-year-old Negro boy of, uh, uh, enslaved by Jean-Baptiste Lemoine, Sieur de Bienville. In fact, Lemoine de Bienville, one of the brothers responsible for the creation of what is currently known as Louisiana, personally held three other enslaved people, at least one of whom was a woman. Among them were a three-year-old child named Joseph, as well as a newborn baby named Antoine Jasmin. Archival records indicate that their mother or mothers were also held in bondage by de Bienville. Antoine Jasmin's father, François Jasmin, for his part, was held in bondage by one of Chateauguay's slave captains. No record indicates where Joseph's father was held captive, nor whether he was alive. This Montreal-based family's history, then, the de Bienvilles, demonstrates that no one colony operated in complete isolation from the French Atlantic. Rather, these colonies and the people within them operate like free electrons orbiting the same shared nucleus. These dynamics would necessarily also occur among Black com communities, pardon me, and within the relationships of Black women. Black communities in contexts of white colonial domination were fundamentally migratory and in constant flux, constructed and reconstructed constantly as new captives were brought from afar and local enslaved individuals sent away or killed regularly. At the same time, these sites were continu continually tethered to both European and African, um, and to both Europe and Africa, pardon me, and the Western world more broadly through the movement of people, goods, and information. Many Canadian historians of slavery have told the story of Olivier Lejeune. They say in 1628, 28, he was sold to Guillaume Couillard by David Kirk, a British pirate. They say he was baptized and named Olivier in 1633. They say in 1654, he passed away at the age of 35. I ask, what of the first seven years of his life? Did he remember his mother? Did he ever try to reach her across an ocean and a lifetime? When Marie-Joseph Angelique was taken from Portugal to the quote unquote new world, she was exposed to a vastly different setting from her native home. At 20 years of age, she had already been forcibly displaced twice, having been taken from Portugal to New England before her arrival in New France, Quebec where she was passed to Sieur de, Fr de Francheville from Fleming, Nicus Bloch, with who sold her. As she became accustomed to her new environment and adjusted again to a new life, I imagine that she sometimes came across a few other enslaved women, both black and pani, which is uh, the colonial term for indigenous women, as she walked the streets of the city on her way to the market or to run errands for her slave owners. Did she make connections quickly? Was she interested in having a network, a community? Was she forced to leave kin behind when she was taken from Portugal, perhaps even her own children? Angelique was not exempt from attempts at capitalizing on her reproductive labor, 
With time, Angelique was coerced into being sexually intimate with another enslaved person in New France, Quebec, Jacques César from Madagascar. He lived uh, with Ignace Gamelin Jr., a merchant and friend of her captors. This forced arrangement resulted in Angelique having three children with César. As an enslaved woman whose status would have would be ascribed to her children as well, she must have felt powerless to protect them, powerless to care for them the way she knew her mother would have cared for her had she still been home. Of her children, her son, Eustache, died first when he was only one month old. I wonder if he was born frail or ill. Given that they live in close, close quarters, it is likely that her sleeping area was within earshot of the Francheville's master bedroom. If Eustache was ill in the weeks leading up to his death, I would imagine that he cried and that all his mother could do to comfort him was comfort him and soothe him to ease his suffering until he passed. Angelique next gave birth to twins, Louis and Marie-Francoise. Her son Louis passed away mere days after birth. His twin, Marie-Francoise, passed in the fall of 1732 at five months of age. I can hardly fathom the grief that must have torn through Angelique every time she recalled her precious little time she had with them. In the two years that followed the death of her last child, how many times did Angelique find herself quietly musing about a path to freedom? She would never experience this, of course, since we know that she was tortured and executed for the alleged crime of burning down Madame Thérèse de Coigne de Francheville's home, along with 45 buildings in what is known as the Old Port of Montreal today, located blocks away from where her life was taken. Um, she was uh, tried and executed for this crime and uh, her body burned and her ashes scattered to the wind. That is literally what the court record says. Um, the circumstances of her confession leave its veracity in doubt as she suffered repeated horrific violence in the time leading up to her acquiescing uh, to this accusation. Slide please. Slavery scholars over the last decades have repeatedly discussed the particularly gendered abuses sustained by enslaved Black women. Specifically, they have discussed the extraction of both productive and reproductive labor from enslaved women. It's widely understood that in the Caribbean and in Southern United States, the reproductive ability of the enslaved came to be viewed as an additional source of income because they offered a means by which to generate more workers by the same token, increasing a revenue exponentially. Many enslaved people face this gut-wrenching reality, bearing children doomed to experience the very atrocities they survived daily. While the exploitation of productive and reproduction and reproductive labor in Saint-Domingue was um, strategic and systematic, these tendencies were quite different in New France, Quebec. The nature of the labor extracted from the enslaved was primarily based in domestic labor and trade. Thus, it seems unlikely that the same extent of reproductive abuse was enacted here. This practice differed both in scale and in nature given the climate and officializing of breeding in the Caribbean and Southern sites. It should be noted nevertheless that rape and sexual coercion for the purpose of slave captors financial gain would have occurred in New France, Quebec too, as we saw with Angelique. Again, given the nature of archival erasure, it's harder to quote unquote prove that these practices existed in New France due to the archival violence through which evidence such as crime uh, of such crimes was either um, neither created or even destroyed. These two are spatial acts, which ultimately reproduce geographies of black placelessness in Canadian history. Reading these archives with tenderness is to name this space and stand within it. Given the temperate climate of Northern parts of the Americas, there were far fewer plantations in the traditional sense that you think of when you think of um, the context of slavery. 
In the context of New France, the circumstances of an enslaved child being born was far more likely to occur out of a forced marriage or out of sexual assault. Women in the American South who were enslaved held as domestics were in closer proximity to their captors and thus in constant, constant presence of the threat of sexual violence. The likelihood of these scenarios is not far outside of the realm of possibility. Um, as Angelique is an example for um, in the attempts by French slaveholders in New France, Quebec to capitalize on her reproductive abilities. When François Maripal de Beaucourt painted the portrait that you see on screen here, portrait of a Haitian woman, formerly named portrait of a Negro slave, um, Marie-Thérèse Zemir, who's the sitter of this portrait, um, was 15 years old, presumably within her pubescent years. The um, three years following the completion of this portrait, a child is quote unquote, born to African parents in Saint-Domingue. Soon thereafter, she was taken from Saint-Domingue, her birthplace to New France, Quebec in the early 1790s. That child, Catherine Guillet, is reported as belonging to the de Beaucourt family, de Beaucourt being the man who painted this portrait. Catherine and Marie-Thérèse lived in the same household for a decade. They would in fact have lived together until Marie-Thérèse's death in the late, um, in late 1800. I believe she passed away in December 1800. This circumstance begs the question, might it be that they were mother and daughter? If that was the case, then Catherine would have grown up possibly seeing this portrait of her parents in the de Beaucourt household. She would have observed her possible mother in her, in, in her seated position, not quite facing her, her face turned to the side, making eye contact. In the portrait, Marie-Thérèse is sitting at a stone table, cradling a platter of fruit to her chest. One of her breasts is exposed and juxtaposed with the fruit. Catherine may have wondered how her possible mother felt sitting there, exposed like that. Perhaps Catherine imagined that her possible mother had felt shy, humiliated even. It is possible that Catherine saw herself in this image as well, both through familial resemblance and through other aspects like dress. It was undoubtedly an exceptional thing to see a special, a specific person depicted in a painting or quote unquote high art of any kind in New France, Quebec at the time. As such, to see Marie-Thérèse in her white shift with a skirt and a colorful scarf on her head, looking very much like other enslaved people, save for the fact that she wore elegant jewelry, a long beaded necklace and glinting gold hoops um, in her ears, might have been for Catherine a rare instance of representation. In the background of the portrait, Catherine would have observed a vast sky with what looked like a big mountain bigger than the one she could see in the distance from the streets of Montréal. Perhaps she and Marie-Thérèse had spoken about this different landscape. It is possible that the rare moments, in rare moments of privacy, Marie-Thérèse shared stories from about home with her daughter, telling her about Saint-Domingue, perhaps even Africa. Living in such close proximity with the de Beaucourt, Catherine would likely also have witnessed and indeed been the target of violent treatment and abuse at the hands of her slave owners. While in New France, Quebec, Black families were small. They seemed to have been more likely to stay together as slaveholders would presumably have wanted to hang on to their profit margin as much as possible through the guarantee of ongoing forced labor as children grew to become adult laborers. At the same time, however, there is evidence that some families indeed forcibly were indeed forcibly separated through sales in New France, Quebec. In Saint-Domingue, enslaved people were not only physically exhausted through the forced extraction of their labor, they were also stripped of their kin as the whole slave system was predicated upon the destruction of families. Alternative networks of feelings emerged through this violent vacuum. Enslaved women, specifically mothers, were the ones who molded the next generations. For example, the relationship between Marie-Thérèse and Catherine, regardless of whether they were biological mother and daughter, would have been akin to a familiar bond, 
a materially cultivated network of feeling. The reality is that Marie-Thérèse would have more than likely had a parental or caretaker role in Catherine's life. They would have been part of each other's network of feeling. In some cases, enslaved folks living in the same household did not develop such bonds. Indeed, in some cases, the schisms were such that white owners had to separate the enslaved altogether. In the case of Monsieur R. Gray, his solution was to sell one of the two black women in his possession because, quote, they disagree together, end quote. In fact, in his haste or desperation to be done with their animosity, Gray's slave sale advertisement indicates that he cared little which of the two women he was rid of, stating simply that he was desirous of disposing of one of them, end quote. In New France, Quebec's context, where most of the labor extracted from the enslaved was within the domestic realm, black women were continually targeted by sexual abuse. Angélique and Marie-Thérèse were undoubtedly repeatedly abused and exploited because of their routine proximity to white slaveholders. For this reason, both of them ran the risk of becoming pregnant and bearing children who would suffer the same fate. Given that it was an urban setting, much like uh, New France, Quebec, the dynamic of domestic enslavement and, and sexual violence in Louisiana were similar. Enslaved women within urban contexts faced heightened levels of violence due to the presence of military garrisons. Pervasive alcoholism among the soldiers aggravated the problem as their presence meant to maintain order instead signaled and indeed worsened the chaos stemming from the issues of uh, neglected duties, disease, desertion, mutiny, and debauchery. The soldier's presence was linked to uh, chaos, misconduct, abuse of power, and promiscuity. In and around ports and marketplaces, the presence of sailors added to the mayhem as they were also known for their overconsumption of alcohol and boisterousness. Case in point, in Saint-Domingue, laws were put in place to close down bars and markets in the evenings, yet most people, business owners, marketplace sellers, and customers alike, simply ignored these laws carrying on well into the night, thus perpetuating the aforementioned chaos. Given the more tropical climate, which would sustain the plantation economy in Louisiana, women were subjected to systematic, uh, systemic forced reproductive labor as well. Women generally lacked control over their bodies in the French colonial context, as their productive and reproductive labor was under constant exploitation and continuously defined uh, by external powers and factors. This left enslaved people of childbearing age with few choices and about how to handle the constant threat of sexual violence and pregnancy being used for profit. As such, infanticide in Saint-Domingue, more so than in Louisiana and New France, Quebec, became a major factor of Black enslaved population. The toxic combination of psychological trauma, constant fear, violence, and desperation in these sites led many people to think the unthinkable and do the unimaginable. Networks of feeling in these cases may have included ties to people well-versed in abortion methods or someone simply to help dispose of remains discre discreetly and without judgment. Such networks in the context of white colonial domination require radical forms of empathy and compassion, which include profoundly disturbing gestures. These too must be understood as spatial acts. The Code Noir, as enacted under the French Empire in 1724 and later under the Spanish Empire in 1777, enclosed crucial nuances in the treatment of Black women's reproductive abilities based on their social status. The Code strictly regimented miscegenation, which is um, sexual intercourse and racial mixing um, between races, obviously. Um, decreed that white, a white man, if a white man had a child with a free woman of color, there was to be a fine of 60 piastres, you know, we can say dollars. Um, whereas if a white man had a child with an enslaved woman, the child was to be confiscate, confiscated by the state in addition to the fine. With these laws then, enslaved black women were specifically targeted 
and at risk of being punished with the loss of their children, despite the fact that it was unlikely that they consented to the sex with the white men involved, given the pervasiveness of rape and sexual assault in the colony. Thus, not only did the gender and race of a person dictate how and when they could access parenthood, regardless of their choice in the matter, their class status also impacted this. The psychological impact of this kind of violent abuse cannot be overstated. To be forced to conceive, gestate, give birth to, and raise a child who can and likely will be taken from them is to put Black female identified people through severe psychological trauma. Many people attempted to gain control of their bodies and agency through extreme measures, which included both abortion and infanticide. Others still chose to run. Slide, please. So on screen now you have a runaway advertisement. And I just wanna very briefly note that um, Bet who ran away, she's described. And then it says, um, was big with child and within a few days of her time. So imagine the level of desperation that Bet must have been experiencing to leave within days of going into labor. In most colonies, absconding, which is a fancy word for running away, um, was a common form of resistance. Runaway advertisements from all over the Americas attest to this ongoing form of resistance. In tropical settings, like in Saint-Domingue, absconding was so effective that several Maroon communities came to be established. Many of those, uh, many people managed to survive for a long time in the woods and mountains of the island. In the tropical context, many more groups of people seem to run away, whereas in urban settings like New France, Quebec and Louisiana, this was more rare. In the context of Louisiana and New France, Quebec, um, several runaway advertisements referred to groups of a few people at best. While in Louisiana, many enslaved people lived with others with whom they might develop connections, a network of feeling, and indeed plot to escape, in a place like New France, Quebec, isolation would have been a major factor as some household only held one person captive. In some cases, a black woman would have dealt not only with the impact of being part of ex the extreme minority of the overall population, as black women were the smallest demographic of um, the overall population, but also with the experience of being enslaved alone. With no one to turn to for support in the household, they would have been light, highly vulnerable to the moods, aggressions, and abuses of their captors and dealt with the psychological fallout of isolation as their basic needs for social interaction were limited to ones that had their um, white enslavers. By the same token, with no one to plan an escape with, Black women in New France, Quebec, might have been able to slip away in the dark of night, unencumbered by children or others. However, their absence would have been noticed immediately within the household, at the very same time as their presence outside of the household would have been highly obvious, given that there were so few other Black women among which they might hide or for whom they might be mistaken. Isolation in the context of New France, Quebec, lent itself to making Black women hyper-visible and thus hyper-vulnerable in many respects. Markets like Congo Square in New Orleans and Louisiana and Place Cuny um, in Cap Francais and Domingue, uh, as well as the tropical climate, may have made it easier for enslaved people to connect and build relationships or networks of feeling. Congo Square, as it's known, um, while new while never officially identified as such by the government of Louisiana and is a space of black placemaking where care networks or networks of feeling might um, have been able to develop and flourish. Dressing in the best clothing and slave people would gather in, these, in this former military for fortification on Sundays to dance, exchange goods and connect to one another. Jessica Marie Johnson notes that they are that they assembled in part to quote renew old loves and to gather new friendships to talk over affairs of, of the past week end quote. These types of gatherings happened in various parts of New Orleans 
until about 1817, when the mayor responding to complaints by the white population decreed that such gatherings were legally to take place only in Congo Square on Sundays between 4 and 6.30 in the afternoon under police surveillance. Congo Square can itself be understood as one of the verbs described by McKittrick, that is, Black geographies in which the, quote, idea of where is a praxis invested in liberation, end quote. The practice of gathering at Congo Square, then, can itself be read as placemaking, as a placemaking activity, which is not exclusively tied to a specific location or to land, but, it, quote, instead invested in freedom, consciousness, and capacity, end quote. In New France, Quebec, the cold weather and smaller population size would have made it harder for people to connect in the same way. The harsh weather would likely have confined many people uh, to their homes unless absolutely necessary. Therefore, they would, there would have been a lot more isolation. Decoupling the notion of Black placemaking and networks of feeling from fixed locations makes it possible to consider other verb moda modalities in the context, in this context, that is to consider Black ungeographic senses of place and space. Isolation did not preclude the formation of Black networks of feeling where it was possible. In New France, Quebec, the Black population was so small that many of the women I encountered in the archive were in fact connected in their lifetime, supporting other families, serving as godparents for one another's children, being landlords or tenants to each other, and even um, having disputes. If you remember Catherine Guillet, for example, uh, she would not only remain connected to the de, de Beaucourt's widow, uh, Benoit Gaetan, um, she would, uh, well into her adulthood, she also became deeply rooted in Montreal's early free Black community. At one point, she would have to resolve her differences with a Black woman named Sarah York, uh, sometimes known as Celeste, who was arrested with a 10-pound bond, which her husband, Joseph Pierre, a local steamboat operator, had to provide uh, to get her out of jail on the condition of her good behavior for six months following her physical assault of Catherine. Sarah's animosity towards Catherine also apparently involved a death threat. Um, while the archive does not allow us to know the nature of their dispute, it does, however, permit us to witness and imagine what must have been Sarah's emotional state around that time. The altercation between Catherine and Sarah occurred in October 1827. In that same year, Sarah lost both of her children. Joseph in February at the age of three, and the nine and a half month old François Xavier that August. Other records of Sarah's disruptive behavior in Montreal over several years point to a woman who was likely in dire need of mental and emotional support as she mourned her children in a time when neither she nor her children were treated as human beings. Sarah and Catherine's altercation allows us to note the complex range of relationships and networks. There's a spider on the podium. It's okay. Sorry. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to start over. Sarah and Catherine's altercation also allows us to note the complex range of relationships held by Black people during this period. While enslaved Black people had many things in common, there were also many things which set them apart from each other, as in natural for as is natural from any human relationship. Um, what more might we learn from the relationship between Sarah and Catherine if they had been more visible in the archive? What does Catherine's present presence in the archive allow us to surmise about her possible mother's life, Marie Thérèse? How might this inform us on how Marie-Thérèse and Angélique might have built community around themselves outside of their so-called so master's household? Black women in New France, Quebec, were among the smallest group in the overall population. As such, they would have lived in, in a position of hypervisibility and invisibility by virtue of their small numbers. Their presence would have simultaneously been easily overlooked and very noticeable in a, in a major, majority population of white and indigenous people. It is crucial to consider how these would have impacted 
uh, their sense of belonging out of community. Slide, please. Um, there's a section in here where I uh, briefly, uh, I mean, I cut it out because of the, the for time concerns, but there is a section in here where I talk about the complexity of Black and Indigenous relationships specifically in these contexts, um, but I, I, I had to remove it for the sake of co coherence in, in the slashing and dashing of this chapter. Anyway, um, the Middle Passage is not only the physical experience of capture and displacement, but also the very psychological, emotional, and economical and social process by which human beings were abhorrently and cruelly transmuted into ch chattel, that is, mu movable property. For some of the um, enslaved people in what would become Canada, then the transatlantic voyage did not end after the first part of the Middle Passage as many were later taken from colonies in the Americas to be brought to places like New France, Quebec. This second middle passage should also be understood as part and parcel of geographies of enslavement of, and black subjugation. And this concept of second, second middle passage is one that is explored by Dr. Charmaine Nelson. Um, when Marie-Thérèse was forced to undergo a second middle passage to make the journey north with her possible toddler, Catherine, she was faced not only with the prospect of reliving the horror of her last journey across a large expanse of water, but also with leaving behind a community she had connected to during her time in Saint-Domingue. Did the memory of this trauma and the fear of the unknown push her to consider escaping to freedom before they embarked? The shock of being transported from the African continent and plopped into the, a population made of a majority of enslaved Black people, only to then be removed once more and forcibly transported to a place where she would have been but one of a very small group of Black people, let alone Black women in New France, Quebec, must have been devastating for Marie-Thérèse. As Marie-Thérèse was taken from Saint-Domingue to New France, the Haitian Revolution was underway, having officially begun in August 1791. Perhaps she suspected that this was the reason her captors, of her captor's northward flight. With battles taking place all over the island, including in Cap Francais, the port city from whence Marie-Thérèse and possibly Catherine Guillet and the De Beaucours uh, likely fled, she was undoubtedly aware of the revolution underway and surely had feelings and opinions about it. If Marie-Thérèse had access to the port and the marketplace in Montreal, it is likely that she was able to gain information about the goings-on of the revolution in Saint-Domingue as sailors and seafaring people were known to be key uh, intercolonial communications, uh, especially among uh, the enslaved. The coming and going of seafaring vessels and people presented opportunities for absconding, for learning new skills and obtaining information from afar, allowing them to remain abreast of developments in other parts of the world. Word of mouth then would have been a crucial mode of communication, which might have allowed her to stay abreast of the developments of the revolution. This cross-geographic web of communication is yet another verve enabling Black ungeographic placemaking and through which networks of feelings could be materially cre created and maintained. In New France, Quebec, enslaved people usually lived um, in very close proximity with their captors. This yielded a form of course intimacy as they lived in the same houses, ate similar food, and as slaveholders baptized the enslaved, served as godparents to their children and named their so-called property after themselves. While the enslaved were not allowed to indulge in del um, delicacies of the time, they likely had access to some basic ingredient as mandated by the Code Noir to feed themselves. Much like free women of color in Saint-Domingue and Louisiana benefited from small notable advantages, house domestics in a place like New France, Quebec would have been granted some small privileges. In this way, networks of feeling might also occasionally cross racial lines. Enslaved women working domestically would have eaten better, dressed more nicely, and received better health care than women working in the fields. This would have been in part because they were more familiar with the master and mistress of the house. Their proximity to the owners would have also made them more likely to 
be perceived from an affectionate standpoint from, for better or worse. And so given this proximity and the pervasiveness of sexual violence, in all likelihood, some of the enslaved were also biologically related to their captors. This might lead to them to being viewed as more human or docile and resulted in a greater likelihood of manumission, which is the legal term for um, freeing an enslaved person. The reverse of this situation, however, would have been their heightened sense of surveillance. Enslaved people serving as domestics would have endured increased, const, uh, in, increased and constant scrutiny from their white captors and would have been um, the first and most likely to feel the impact of mood swings from the mistress and master. These women at Const were these women were at constant risk of the sexual of sexual assault from any and all of the men in the household or their male guests and visitors. This is recorded in the archive. Given this access to better living conditions and heightened exposure to aggressive tendencies from slaveholders, enslaved women in these settings developed unique relationships to their captors. But like every relationship, especially ones within which there is an inherent power dynamic, relationships between white and black women were extremely contentious. Black and white women coexisted in an intimate social waltz because white women's gender was predicated upon the subjugated position of their racial counterpart. In the last decades, slavery scholars uh, I'm talking from contemporary moments, the last few decades. Um, slavery scholars have turned their attention to dismantling the longstanding perception that white women were merely victims of patriarchy who happened to live during the period of slavery and instead consider the ways in which they were impact, uh, implicated. White women actively took part in the economy of slavery and were fully engaged in all aspects of the system. Slide, please. They contribute to, contributed to the reproducing and maintaining white wealth in their families by bequeathing enslaved women to their female relatives and friends. White women thus gained economic, social, racial, and sexual power through their participation in slave economies. In this way, white women contributed yet another systemic, systematic disruption of black networks of feeling. The relationship, whoop, sorry, I moved. The relationship between black and white women as a site through which gender was constructed. That is white women's gender was predicated upon the negation of black women's access to the same identity. Black women were subordinated by white people across the board like their male counterparts. They faced sexist treatment from men across the board as well. White women for their part while benefiting from their whiteness, faced the misogyny inherent in a patriarchal social fabric. At the same time, their connections to white men of certain social classes afforded them several advantages which enslaved black women could hardly aspire to access. The triple subordination of black women played out differently in the context like New France, Quebec, where not only were black women facing oppression and isolation from various angles, they also had few other black women to lean on for support or community. If Marie-Thérèse did in fact play a maternal role in the life of Catherine, Marie-Thérèse must have feared that the child would be taken away from her despite having been displaced together. Nothing, is, nothing was certain. Perhaps the de Beaucourt would have decided to, um, they preferred the money from the sale than the labor of a child or that mining, uh, minding Catherine was too much of a distraction for Marie-Thérèse and selling her would uh, be an easy fix to this issue. When she passed away, Marie-Thérèse left behind a 12-year-old Catherine who was to be in the care of the de Beaucourt widow, Benoît Gaëtan. Soon after uh, Marie-Thérèse's passing in December uh, 1800, yes, I was right, I remembered, okay. Um, soon after the passing of Marie-Thérèse um, in December 1800, Catherine took ill and was admitted to the Hôtel Dieu Hospital. One year later, in January 1802, Catherine was once again admitted to the hospital by um, widow de Beaucourt. Might it be that Catherine was sick with grief becoming unwell on the anniversary of her parental figure's death. 
Whatever her ailment, grief or otherwise, Catherine would have had to cope with being a Black enslaved girl in New France, Quebec, without the guidance of a female, Black female elder in the same household. As she grew up enslaved by the Dubocourt widow, any kindness she received may have been met with uh, skepticism, as the integrity of such actions would undoubtedly have been marred by the reality of forced servitude in which she lived. Their relationship would inherently have been tense and Catherine would have constantly walked uh, a tightrope of obedience and servitude while also playing the role of the pseudo daughter for the white mistress. Catherine would have had to deal with accepting a twisted kind of care and tenderness from a woman who simultaneously laid claim to her life and body and kept her captive for many years. Uh, over the years, Catherine and Widow de Boucourt might also have eventually developed some form of kinship or of a working relationships. Um, they were at least familiar enough with each other for Widow de, Widow de Boucourt to refer to Catherine as Cura and Cora interchangeably, which I was doing some extra research earlier and I found out that um, Catherine actually didn't use that, that uh, name in her day-to-day -day life later on, and so I don't think she liked that. Anyway, um, though this may have been a tactic used by her, the white mistress to exercise her control over Catherine by changing her name at will, as evidenced by uh, common naming practices by slaveholders. Did it come as a surprise to Catherine then when she was manumitted in 1806? Perhaps Benoit Ket uh, Catherine enslaved to watch over her until she reached adulthood, thinking that the girl would be safer in her household than in, in any other New France, Quebec, uh, uh, in, in, other, in any other place in New France, Quebec at the time. Catherine might have known this to be the intention of Widow de Beaucourt and willingly stayed with her as she awaited her 17th birthday. Whatever the reason, when the time came, Catherine went on to work about 15 years as a free woman in the household of a free Black couple on Saint-Augustin Saint Street, John Trim, a leading Black figure in Montreal throughout the early 19th century, and Charlotte Trim, formerly enslaved to Jane Cook. It was seen that Catherine and Benoit kept in contact and remained close enough for the widow de Beaucourt to deem it appropriate to include Catherine in her will. Indeed, Widow de Beaucourt, who had remarried by then, left Catherine six whole pounds and further noted that she should be, um, that should the Franchère, her new in-laws, find furniture and clothing she left them unsuitable, they could give it to Catherine instead. <laughs> Slide, please. Um, in, when I was doing my research earlier, I also came to find out that she, Catherine, would go on to have nine children, um, all of whom are recorded in the archive, but I haven't gotten there from that far yet. Um, we will never know for certain how these relationships played out, such as the nature of Black placelessness in the archive. We will never be privy to the facts surrounding Catherine Guillet and Sarah York's dispute, nor will it ever be clear what type of relationship Marie-Thérèse and Catherine Guillet had for the years they shared at home. All we know to be true is that these women and girls were human beings with full and complicated emotions, opinions, and life experiences. Working through the archival documents and images using uh, Black feminist art historical praxis, that is working with tenderness as a method, allows for a fleeting glimpse into what their experiences may have been Black women were responsible for the upbringing of many children and thus were behind much of their cultural development as they played a key role in the intergenerational survival of certain practices. Among the most powerful things about the legacy of enslaved Africans in the Americas is the way in which the, the, the enslaved managed to maintain portions of their cultural and spiritual practices. Through shared oral history and cultural contact, through networks of feeling, new practices also emerged. Black livingness emerged. Within the context of French colonial sites of domination, New France, Quebec, Saint-Domingue, and Louisiana are key Black diasporic spaces through which to consider the extent and quality of acts of self-preservation and self-care through forms of cultural expression such as dress, hair care, and hairstyling practices. 
Without these relationships, especially intergenerational ones, one cannot be certain that the same rich cultural life would exist among Black communities to this day. That is to say that these networks of feeling were crucial sites of resistance to the slaving system's attempt to destroy Black culture and Black life. Indeed, several strategies were used throughout the period of slavery by multitude colonial powers to stamp out Black resistance and Black cultural expression. Many of these strategies were in fact aimed directly at cultural practices relating to forms of, forms of expression through hair and dress. Black women were both the catalyst for and target of these laws, decrees, and edicts as white colonial powers scrambled to maintain control and power over Black bodies. The networks of feeling, these networks of feeling fostered between Black women and girls were a key site of cultural expression and major source of anxiety for the white slaving class. In uh, what remains of this eventual book, um, I go into uh, these specific laws and decrees and um, uh, visual analyses of images such as the ones you've seen on screen today. Thank you for your attention and time. That, hey, look at that, now it's working, wonderful. Thank you very much, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for reconstructing feeling in the historical understanding of this time period because it is so ethereal and it has escaped, as you say, the, there's so many inhuman spaces in the archival record. So thank you for bringing humanity to the archival record and thank you for also bringing theory to also flesh out that archival record. This is time for questions and answers. Um, um, I hope you have some questions and I know there will be some answers here. I'm gonna moderate this and I could, will only ask that if you want to ask a question, please go to Janine and the microphone because we are uh, streaming this so our people at home can also uh, get some of this. And uh, I'm gonna ask the first question and that way people can formulate questions in their minds. But my question would be is I'm more familiar with the English side of things mm -hmm. in the uh, 1700s and a little bit after your time period or after the initial time period, you talk about a woman, a formerly enslaved woman, Phyllis Wheatley, mm -hmm. was known to uh, tell her narrative and her tale and was published widely and give lectures and that. And so I'm very ignorant of the French side of the Ancien Regime and what happened. Was there a French equivalent? Like, uh, as you're bringing air back into the ar archives and humanity in the archives, are there other sources that can help you, perhaps like a French equivalent of Phyllis Wheatley? That's a wonderful and generous question. Thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, so far, I have yet to come across like a Black authored record similar to the kinds of slave narratives that we might um, find in the British colonial period. Um, I will refuse to lose hope. Um, one of the things that's particular though is one of the things that I've noticed in French colonial archives is that a lot of them are in quite bad condition and a lot of them have been destroyed or are literally falling apart. Um, and I, I don't know why that is. Um, and the other thing too is that um, one argument that has been made um, for this earlier period is that uh, there are similar narratives that we must read even though they were technically authored by white folks. So if we think, for example, of uh, The Hanging of Angelique mm -hmm. uh, by Afua Cooper, which is a, an incredibly important record, and much of that record stems from what Angelique said to um, her captors, right? Right, right, about what happened with that fire. And so um, the portions that pertain to her early life can and perhaps even should be read as this kind of uh, narrative, right. right? Even though she didn't author it, she did orally relay her story. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, yeah. No, I hear what you know. That's wonderful. And that, that is this idea that you're reading against the source, against the grain and trying to fill mm -hmm. in, you know, mm -hmm using emotion, feeling uh, other aspects to try to bring that in because it is so difficult when the sources are so rare. Right? Yes. Yeah. No. Other questions that people have that they may want to pose at this time. Yes, Lindsay. Oh. 
Uh, Dr. Joaquin, um, that was a very interesting talk, but if I may say, I'm not an academic and um, I, I appreciate its excerpts from your, your uh, proposed academic book. Have you considered uh, writing a more popular, shorter version? Mm -hmm. Because history, as you may know, is not well taught. It's, it's disappearing or being downplayed in provincial curricula. Um, even in my day, uh, the history of New France was once over lightly, and it certainly didn't touch on slavery because it, it wasn't widespread because of the climate. I know more about Louisiana experience than what you're unearthing. It was fascinating, but I really would urge you to write in a more popular style so more people can learn about this. Thank you. Um, I have, in the last I want to say in the last year and a half, been discovering myself very much as a writer. Um, and I sort of accessible language is something that's always been very important to me. Um, and it's for for whatever reason, I guess, because it's still a um, it's a book that I'm still developing. Um, the language that I'm using to try to understand the thing that I see happening needs to be the way that it is, however, comma. Um, it is very important to me in my writing outside of this project that the ideas that I'm conveying be digestible because I do feel like academic writing tends to wind up so, sort of alienating the people who might best benefit from that information. Um, I've never thought of writing a popular book I'm just trying to write a book right now and we'll see what happens. But um, but I am discovering that writing is the form of communication that I think might best suit me outside of the classroom, I think. Um, and so thank you for affirming that. I really appreciate it. That's wonderful. Oh, yes, Kathy. A question from the online audience. Uh, what kinds of controls were imposed on hair and dress? Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little about the relations between Black and Indigenous during the 1700s in New France? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the types of control uh, vary widely. So there are things like, for instance, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the journey, right, before the Middle Passage even happens, oftentimes the enslaved who were kidnapped would have their head shaved before they were taken onto the ship, which was simu simultaneously at like a sanitary thing to like uh, limit the spread of lice and things, but also a way of um, stripping cultural trappings from the enslaved people's bodies, right? Because in a lot of different African cultures, hairstyles um, denote where you are from, who you belong to, right? Um, so that's one thing. And then if we look on the other side of the Middle Passage, there are things like the Tignon Law, which I do go into in later parts of the book, um, where Black women were required by this edict um, to cover their hair with a fabric of some sort. So for example, uh, the image of Marie-Thérèse Zemir, that's an example of what a tignon might look like. Um, and that was because, as I've found in the archive, uh, there was a lot of anxiety around um, the supposed um, racial ambiguity of paler skinned black women. And in order to make them legible as non-white, they were required to wear this head wrapping. Um, so that's a, a couple examples. The other question was about black and indigenous relationships. Now that's a complicated one um, because we have to remember that in the French colonial context, the indigenous people, Pani people were um, enslaved alongside black folks, right? So there's that sort of parallel relationship. And at the same time, um, in terms of social class. And at the same time, there were some free indigenous folk who would help enslaved black folk run away. But at the same time, there were some indigenous folks who were enslaving black folks, right? So it's it's, it's a bit of a mess um, that I'm still parsing through. And so that's why I said it's complex and I took, the, I took it out because uh, there's a lot there. But thank you for that question, those questions. Great, other, yes, at the back. Uh, 
Hi there. Uh, Hi. Thank you for your uh, talk today. Um, I want to know about your archive research experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds extensive, so I, I just would like to know a little bit more about how long you've been doing this and where you've been going to do it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so I've been digging through the archives, I want to say since 2017-ish, 17. I've gone to Quebec City. I've obviously been in and around the archives in Montreal. I've gone to New Orleans. I tried to go to France, Aix-en-Provence, because when the French left, fled, Haiti after the French Revolution they took their archives with them and so they're technically in France even though they relate to Saint-Domingue and I wrote to the archives in Aix-en-Provence and they never got back to me and so I still have not been able to access those. Um, I have also accessed uh, archives online. There's a lot of great digitizing projects. Make yourself some archive ar archivist friends. They're amazing. Um, and so I've used a lot of digital archives, namely um, the oh, Marronage dans l'Atlantique database, which is this fantastic database that was launched, I think, around 2017 or 18, um, where they digitized a whole bunch of French Atlantic newspapers, um, specifically advertisements for sale and uh, runaway uh, enslaved people in Saint-Domingue. And so that's been a great source of information for me as well. So those are the places I've gone. Um, and in terms of my experience, it's a mixed bag. Um, it's psychologically and emotionally a horrific experience. I'm not going to lie to you. I've read some pretty awful stuff. Um, and it's also an incredibly frustrating experience because oftentimes I go to the archive and I'm perceived as not belonging in that space, right? So already that sort of interpersonal piece is a barrier. And then in addition to that, and I hope, I, I think slash hope that it's changing with time, but in the early days, I would go to the archive and I would be told, oh no, we don't, there, there's no, there's nothing about black people here. You're not, no, there's nothing, you know, because the archivists themselves, even though I love archivists and I think they're amazing, um, couldn't wrap their head around the possibility that these histories exist because as you've mentioned earlier in our school systems, these are histories that are not taught, right? So the archivists goes through the school system not knowing that these are histories that they might come across and so they don't see them or look for them in the collections that they are taking care of right so anyway I have opinions about this thank you for your question Melissa um, I just wanted to say thank you for the emotional labor that goes into into doing this work um, and I guess my question is somewhat there and it's maybe a hope but in your book or in the archives have you found examples of black joy oh um yes and no I would say yes in the sense that all of Congo Square for me as an example is a form of black joy right black folks coming together on their one day off a week to be together right to share to talk to um to to live Right. And then there are moments of what I've been referring to as pettiness, which to me is a form of black joy um, where there's I can't I'm not going to remember exactly where it is. But it, and this is this is in New Orleans. There. Um, there is this record in which we see that free black women in New Orleans start wearing not only shoes but they're open toe shoes and they start wearing rings on their toes now why is this hilariously joyful to me it's because in tropical settings shoelessness is a mark of enslavement right so in order to differentiate themselves and to to claim their social status as being free people they're wearing fancy shoes and they're decorating their toes i just these moments make me happy also there's a um an 11-year-old girl 
named Babette, also in Louisiana, I believe. Um, and she shows up in the record because she's arrested. And she's arrested because when her so-called owner rented her out to some other guy, she robbed the other guy and then went to the market to buy herself candy and pecans. So those moments for me are where I'm really interested in thinking about self-preservation and self-care, right? Um, so, yeah. Any other questions? At the oh, Janine, you have a question. Hi, it actually sort of reflects a bit on Lindsay and the question about hair as well. But also when you were speaking, there were moments when you let the tenderness you felt in the archives enter what you were talking about. And it was the moment you were talking about, um, I think it's Catherine and is it Marie-Louise that you think is her mother? Marie-Thérèse. Marie-Thérèse. And the idea of like this woman who may or may not be your mother, but who is your caretaker. And the image I had was of my friend helping her daughter manage her hair. Yes. Right? And that's such a, it sort of took away the veil of 400 years of history, mm -hmm. right? Because we're all still the same people. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Anyway, yeah, thank you for question. that. But yeah, but it's beautiful. It's, this is a, like, so obviously this is an, an evolution of my dissertation, um, but one of the passages that I put in my acknowledgement for my dissertation when I defended it was actually about a hair story that I have with my own mom. Um, because um, this was way back in kindergarten. I was graduating kindergarten and it was the most important moment in my life. And um, I was dressed in an all white crinoline outfit from the top of my head to the tippy toes. It was amazing. And I remember that my mother put my hair in a slicked back butt high butt, which ultimately became a problem because my construction paper graduation cap would not fit, right? And I remember that my uh, my teacher um, ended up having to sort of yank my bun aside to put the construction cap on my head. And I was devastated because now my hair was messed up on the most important day of my life. And um, after the ceremony ended, my mother came by and she re-slicked my hair and put it into a low bun so that the cap would fit properly. And I just remember this being such an important moment for me. Um, and I also remember that very soon after that, I started requesting from my mother that she would straighten my hair, right? And that continued until I was I want to say nine-ish when she finally allowed me to straighten my hair. And then I had straight hair moving forward until my 20s, right? So um, there is a very interrelated piece there that you're touching on. Um, and so thank you for bringing that up. Wonderful. F finest. Yeah, I just had a quick question about um, the images that we saw yes. during the presentation. And in particular, um, I noticed there was a mix of uh, paintings from the time period under study, but then also a number of contemporary works. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how you're using those uh, in your in your work um, to, particularly the contemporary ones, to mm -hmm. open up new questions about the past, to create some kind of dialogue with the past, mm -hmm. disrupt what you're finding in the archives, and how do you see that relationship between the contemporary work and, and the past? Yes, thank you for that. Um, that's a great question and a generous one, and I'm glad you brought it up because I meant to sort of address the images. Um, as you were saying earlier, I have both the sort of uh, archival, historical, angle, but then also a more theoretical uh, angle that I'm bringing in to sort of bridge the gaps within the archive because the French colonial archive is very gappy. And so I'm using contemporary images as pathways to thinking through what it is that's in the gaps, right? And then I'm also very intentionally looking exclusively at the work of black women from contemporary women from the sites in the study uh, because it was anathema to me to look only at artworks by white people. I, mean, I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So 
I just needed to sort of bring black female agency into the images because as you saw for instance with the portrait of Marie Therese right not only is she not named she's disrobed obviously not consensually she's also displaced right so there's just like and a lot of the historical images that I'm looking at have this sort of built-in lack of agency for the black female sitters that I could not abide and so working cross historically allows me to sort of restore that piece. Voila. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this has been great. I think it's now time for me to call upon Professor Heather Nichol, who is the director of the School for the Study of Canada, Nicole des Etudes Canadiennes. And uh, please join us. Heather, thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's my, my privilege uh, to uh, thank you. Oh. Joanna, for your uh, for your exceptional presentation. Thank you so much, Heather. I, I want to thank you. You know, selfishly on behalf of 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 the the school, Nicole, and 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 uh, the students here, because you know we do we um, anybody who's here and gra done graduate work and and uh, the program. And I see John and a few people. You know, we 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 start beginning with McKittrick, and we think about some of these issues, but we never get past the ought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we never get to the could. Yes. We never fully understand the emotional, you know, the meanings and the emotional landscapes and why that's important. Mm -hmm. And so I've personally, thank you, I've learned so much today, but I want to thank you on behalf, I think, of others who have <laughs> other, uh, have done other, uh, um, you know, come to other sort of realizations and, and a little epiphanies today. And, and I think, uh, I don't think we could have invited a, a better person to oh, speak to us. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. <laughs>